So I'm Rick Green. I'm a member of Team Ember, or as we're apparently known now, the Integrated Additive Manufacturing Group. And today I want to talk about high fidelity printing techniques. That is, ways to make our prints more faithful to the original designs. So to set a little context, um, when I was a kid, my cousins had a mobile audio device, kind of like this one here. We call it a record player. And the sound wasn't that great, but it was good enough for us kids. And what did we know about frequency response or harmonic distortion? It was easy to use, and we got our sound out of it. My uncle, on the other hand, had a hi-fi system. This produced high-fidelity sound, very faithful to the original recordings. But it was also somewhat tricky to use. It was kind of a delicate uh, instrument, and uh, we kids weren't allowed to even touch it. Kind of like uh, alcohol and cigarettes, too. <laughs> so there's a similar duality in the way that Ember can be used. Uh, and that's because the projector that's in it was designed to um, go into two very different markets. The consumer market for th applications like home theater, and also industrial market for applications like structured lighting and 3D printing. So for the home market, they provided what they called uh, video mode. And they also wanted to make the projector as small uh, as possible. Inside the projector, there's this digital micro mirror device, or DMD. It's got tens of thousands of these little tiny mirrors, each of which tilts on an axis along their diagonal. And that's how they modulate the light that gets sent to, the, um, uh, to our print area, in our case. So the light has to come in from the side. Um, perpendicular to this diagonal. And what they chose to do was to orient all of those individual micro mirrors in what they call a diamond orientation. Now each one you can see it's square, but they're oriented at 45 degrees to the X and Y axes. So they call it a diamond configuration, and this allows them to send the light in from the side, and they only have this kind of cross section for their uh, optics. Whereas if they had a normal sort of orthogonal orientation, they would have to send the light in diagonally this way, and their optics would have to be big enough to cover this whole diagonal. So I think that's the basic reason why they chose to use this um, diamond orientation, but it introduces a number of issues. In video mode, we're sending it an ordinary video image consisting of uh, an orthogonal array of square pixels, and there's no way to map those one-to-one -to, -one to the mirrors, the micro mirrors, the diamond orientation. This these red lines here, these have the same pitch as the micro mirrors, but because the orientation is different, you can see um, this particular pixel outlined in red here would go to three different micro mirrors. And we got a um, micro mirror here that would pick up information from four different pixels. So it's a many to many kind of a mapping. And the only way that they can deal with that is to basically resample the incoming video stream to match the, the layout of the diamond pixels. And in order to minimize aliasing artifacts, they have to low pass filter before they resample. The net result is we're throwing away resolution and our images are getting smeared out. So you can imagine if you had one white pixel surrounded by all black, the best that you could hope to get in that once it's converted to the diamond orientation would be a fairly bright pixel in the middle surrounded by a bunch of grays. And if you send it patterns like this, uh, these come from a really good article by um, Carl Gutag, um, single pixel checkerboard or single pixel white and black alternating lines, you get these kinds of aliasing artifacts or moray patterns or beat patterns. And so you can see the actual intensity of a pixel is going to depend on just where it is within your, your image. So that's unfortunate. And again, the net effect is to smear out your image, lower the effective resolution of the printer. OK, but you remember there is a more sophisticated way <laughs> to use the printer as well. And we're in the process of actually making it easy to use, even for you kids. That mode is called pattern mode. Uh, in pattern mode, what we're going to need to do is to create an intermediate image, higher resolution than our current um, 1280 by 800 image. It would be 1482 by 1482, 
but we're only going to use this section that corresponds to the size of our build area rotated by 45 degrees. Um, if you notice, uh, so this is a uh, isosceles right triangle here, this black area. We've got 912 pixels here. There's 912 pixels here. How many pixels do you suppose there are along the diagonal, the hypotenuse? 1280. Anybody know their Pythagorean theorem? 14.4 times 1.44? 4 Square root of 2 times 912, which would be 1290. No, actually, there's 912 pixels, but they're oriented uh, corner to corner. Diagonal, That's right. Mm -hmm. So those correspond to our, the arrangement of our micromirrors in the DMD. So when we do this, they're actually, the, now the, the micromirrors line up with our um, intermediate image. And then we can do a mapping from any pixel at X and Y position in our intermediate image into a particular row and column in the DMD. Now they have this funny kind of a zigzag arrangement to the columns. That's the way Texas Instruments chose to wire these up. This, this is another picture from the Carl Gutag article. So we have to use this weird function to map from X and Y position to row and column. Um, but it's actually a very simple function, and you'll notice all we have on this side of the equation are x and y. We're not looking at neighboring values, x minus 1, x plus 1, or y minus 1, y plus 1. There's no filtering going on. Simple one-to-one -one map. And users aren't going to have to worry about any of this because we'll take care of that mapping in firmware. So here's an example. Here's a, a, a little uh, 3D model. These things are all pretty small. So this is a blown up image of just the center of a 1280 by 800 video mode image, the way those things would be sliced currently. And what we're going to do is we're going to take their model behind the scenes, rotate it by 45 degrees before we slice it into that larger 1482 square image. These are going to be the, the, this is going to be the slice data that we actually send to the projector. And then in firmware, we'll do that weird mapping to generate this final pattern mode image. All right, so what do we get for all this trouble? Well, we, we basically get higher resolution in pattern mode. Here is um, a slice image of alternating black and white pixels. And this is the way it looks when printed in video mode. This is the way it looks in pattern mode. Here you can see those, those uh, beat patterns or aliasing artifacts that we get here as things are kind of smeared together and the intensity of a pixel depends on where it is. For these diagonal lines, they get so smeared out that basically all that we print are some um, interference patterns. Moray, right? Moray, yeah. If we zoom in, we can see that, um, you can see here how they're all kind of smeared together, whereas in pattern mode, we can see each individual micro mirror. I mean, we can even see the little dimple where its hinge is attached to it. Wow. So that's how sharp it can be. All right, so um, in pattern mode then, we can even print um, individual voxels without having their size depend on where they are. And so we can do studies of voxel growth. Um, here's a, a, a set of voxels that were all printed at once. These big ones all had the same uh, maximum exposure. And then in between them, we've got a, uh, a growing voxel, if you will, um, at different exposures, increasing exposures in this direction by means of increasing gray, gray values. And so these uh, ones that were at maximum intensity on the sides could be used as sprockets to line up a movie. Here's the same slice printed in video mode. and you basically can't tell which is a sprocket and which was the voxel that you might be interested in because, again, their size depends on where they happen to be placed. But we can now take these individual frames, put them together into a movie, and see basically how does a voxel grow with increasing exposure, or increasing dose, I should say. And one thing you might want to notice is a couple things. Notice there's nothing until a certain point we reach a critical threshold and the voxel starts growing. This would be in real time if uh, these 
exposures were converted to times instead of gray values. And another thing to notice is uh, we've got this uh, round kind of a cross section to the voxel. Oh, and also that it grows both in width and in height. So those are things to keep in mind for later. So here's an example of um, something else we can do in pattern mode. We can show very small text. So this text is less than a millimeter tall. In, um, this was the original slice image. Um, you can see we've got this uh, stair stepping along the A. In video mode, that all gets smoothed out. So if that's what you want, there's a nice smooth line there. Hey, you know, video mode might be what you want. In pattern mode, it's going to show all of those little details. But it also means we get square ends where we want square ends. Um, and in, in video mode, we don't have a choice of where this kind of smoothing is happening. It's going to happen everywhere. Whereas in pattern mode, we could smooth this out if we wanted to smooth the slices out. We'll be talking about that later. So we can also print finer 3D features in, in pattern mode than we can in video mode. This is a test geometry of Brian's with uh, posts that go from half a millimeter square down to 50 microns. And uh, you can see that in pattern mode, we actually are getting things printed at these, for these tiniest, thinnest posts that just aren't getting printed in video mode. We can also get sharper corners when we print in video mode. I'm sorry, when we print in pattern mode. Uh, another thing we can do in video mode is to use things like this single pixel checkerboard pattern here to create a nice uniform texture that can serve as a, um, a second color, if you will, for printing barcodes. So these are some very, very tiny barcodes using a couple of different methods to try to print them at different sizes. And you can see that this nice um, single pixel checkerboard prints quite well in pattern mode. We can see there must be some, uh, there, you know, there might have been some streaks on the tray or something that show up here. In video mode, we again get this moray pattern. And uh, try as I might, I could not get nice even uh, illumination across this. And even at, the, at its most even, the contrast is not going to be as good as what we get in pattern mode. Zooming into that, you can see for the smallest barcode, we're using single pixels here. Some of those single pixels print up here. But basically, in, in video mode, you know, we're lucky if we get anything. OK, so I want to uh, transition now and talk about grayscales. Uh, one of the nice side effects of using pattern mode is that we actually can get more grayscales out of Ember. Um, in Ember, our slice images are um, 8 bits per pixel. That means we can have up to 256 different gray levels. But because of the way the video system is wired up to the projector in Ember, we can only show um, at most 64 of them. And we can do that in, in pattern mode. In video mode, we get, I have to say now, roughly 32. I just found yesterday there's some kind of effect that's giving us a few more than, than 32 gray levels. But it's not as many as we can get in, in pattern mode. Now, the gr use of grayscales also allows us to improve the fidelity of prints. First of all, this is what the grayscales of different precision look like. So um, up here, we've got the uh, 256 different gray levels that we can uh, represent on a um, image slice. Uh, that's 8 bits per pixel. This looks pretty uniform to the naked, naked eye. Down here at 64 steps, 6 bits per pixel. This is the best we can do currently with Ember. And that would be in pattern mode. In uh, video mode, we get about these 32 gray levels, or 5 bits per pixel. So why do we care about gray levels and how many there are? Well, again, we can actually use those to achieve uh, better resolution than the raw pixel count of the, um, either our slice images or the DMD would suggest. Here's an example of printing some uh, little uh, cubes. Um, the one that's printed here is offset from the one that's over here by just a single pixel, 50 microns. 
these ones in the middle, by using gray values along their edges, actually print at intermediate positions between 0 and 50 microns offset. So this one used 50% gray on both sides, and it's, so it's offset by roughly 25 microns. These here use 25% and 75% on alternate sizes, sides, so we get a quarter of a pixel offset here. That done in video mode? This one was done in video mode, and this, this technique works in video mode as well as pattern mode. Mm -hmm. So just by using these three different gray values, I was able to uh, move that edge in increments of a quarter of a pixel. Now given that we've got 32 or 64 gray levels, how many increments do you think Ember can actually resolve? So four, everybody hopefully believes this thing. <laughs> how anybody say eight? Yeah. 16? 32? 64? Yeah. yeah? 128? No, that's impossible. No way. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, uh, we're going to get to that. But now you might be thinking, well, you don't really care about subpixel resolution. All of your images are uh, pure binary images. Um, black and white, like this center one here, and so you don't care about gray levels. Well, if the image scale factor in your ember is set to anything other than one, we're going to be adjusting the size of those images, which is going to, even for a 1% change, is going to introduce gray levels along the edges, and you should be glad that they're there because that's how we're actually going to get you dimensional accuracy down to the subpixel level. And of course, if you're doing printing in video mode, um, you're going to get gray levels whether you want them or not along the edges. And if you are printing anti-aliased images, well, then, then we really need those uh, gray scales. All right, so to figure out just how many different uh, gray levels we could uh, resolve and how the width of a voxel changes depending on the gray level, um, I did this print based on a suggestion from Brian about how to measure that. This is a, uh, here's a cross section through the image stack. The Z direction is going up. And it's basically this L-shaped block. But in the single pixel along the edge here, we have a grayscale gradient. It goes from white to black in 32 steps. And when we print that, we get this nice edge that you can see. Now to actually measure that, um, we can take from the image, extract the profile of that edge. Here I flipped it around to, uh, so we can put uh, lateral extent on, the, uh, on our y-axis. And then here I just magnified, uh, scaled up by four times this image in the vertical direction so that it's easy to see where the actual increments are coming. And of course, we have these little scallops on the edge of each layer. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we can see, well, clearly we've got, 32, we've got 32 data points here because we had 32 steps. Do we really have 32 increments of width? You know, there are a couple here where it's maybe a little questionable whether it actually changed at all. But I'd say on the whole, yeah, uh, we're, we're taking our 150 micron pixel and we've divided it up now into roughly 32 different uh, increments. So that would be 1.6 microns uh, resolution. So again, this isn't, we can't do that within a pixel. We can't put 50, we can't put 32 different points, for example, print 32 different points within a pixel. But for any particular feature that exists along some x or y position, we can adjust that x or y position in those kinds of increments. So that 32-step uh, gradient, of course, is just what we would want if we were going to be trying to anti-alias a line that was inclined, or, or a surface that was inclined at about uh, 3.6 degrees from the vertical. And you can see there, it does line up pretty damn well with a line. These are 25 micron layers? These are 25 micron layers, yeah. That's why in cross-section, these all, all of our voxels look like rectangles. Uh, 25 microns high, 50 microns wide. Okay, so can we do better than that? Well, here's a 64-layer stack, 
with again a gradient that goes from white to black in a single pixel along its edge. Um, the, the scale here is, is, is smaller just to fit it into the uh, slide. But uh, again, so this is what it looks like when it's printed. Here we can extract that edge. Turn it on its side, scale it up by a factor of four, and this is what we get. So if you look down here at the low end, you know, we're not really getting stuff there. And we're getting weird stuff here. If we go back and look at the picture, you can see there's some kind of fu there's some fuzziness up here, and it sort of descends vertically for a while before it starts incrementing. So I wouldn't say that we're necessarily getting all 64 of those levels, but we're certainly getting a lot of them. If we uh, zoom in here, and here I just drew red lines at uh, the peak, which would be the, the maximum lateral extent for each of these layers, we can see that it is, you know, except for some glitches, uh, it's monotonically increasing. It's not so uniform here, but uh, we should also bear in mind, we're, at this point we're getting close to the resolution of the microscope. Uh, and our uh, camera that we're using to take pictures through the scope uh, at this point has got uh, like 2.3 pixels for, per micron. So we're going to get aliasing with the imager in the camera. So I suspect that's why these steps, you know, here again, I've magnified this by a factor of four. So if this is a four pixel difference, it really was only a one pixel difference in the original. And it's going in, you know, alternating one pixel, two or three, one pixel, two or three, something like that. So whoever guessed 64 was, was close, uh, I would say. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly, I think we can do better than 32. And again, this is just what we would want in order to anti-alias a surface that was inclined at about 1.8 degrees from the vertical. So how does anti-aliasing work anyways? Well, we can take an analogy from 2D graphics. There it works because uh, for very small objects, the eye regards the uh, objects that have lower contrast to their background as being smaller. So that means um, if we only have one gray level, one bit per pixel, this is about the best we can do on a line. We're going to get these awful jaggies. But at the same spatial resolution, if we've got some gray values that we can plug in there, if we've got a few bits per pixel, we can basically fill those little jaggies with gray levels and get something that looks a lot smoother. Same thing essentially uh, happens in the printer, except there it's actually, again, the size of a voxel, as we saw from that movie, that depends on the dose that it gets. So in our um, online slicer, um, it's only looking at a, um, a single sample point in the center of each voxel. If that's inside the model, it says we're going to make that a white pixel. If it's outside the model, it makes it black. It then does some, it adds some grays afterwards in a post process uh, to each slice, but by then we've lost all the geometry information. So this is the kind of um, prints we get of, a, this is like a 70 degree inclined surface um, when we use our online slicer. Using analytic slicing, we can look at the equation for that surface decide, well, how much of each pixel along the edge does it really cover? Use that to set a gray level. That then gives us a much smoother anti-aliased edge. Now, that works fine for a um, single inclined plane. Um, for something like a, a, the actual 3D models that uh, we and our customers are printing, the analytic approach um, essentially is, is not going to work. Um, so what we did was to um, borrow a technique from computer graphics. This was first suggested by Ryan Schmidt up, uh, with the Toronto team, and that is to use super sampling. In that case, instead of taking one sample at the center of a pixel, we take multiple uh, samples um, per voxel and use the number of those samples that are inside the model to decide what's the gray level we should assign to that particular voxel. So Ramesh, Santhanam has uh, implemented that in Print Studio uh, with four by four samples in each of X and Y. And um, so this is the kind of um, slice. This is looking top down at this 
top slice, obviously not to scale here. Um, this is a 15 millimeter diameter hemisphere. And by using four samples, uh, four times the sampling in each direction, that's 16 samples per uh, voxel, we can have up to 16 different gray levels per voxel, and that gives us some really nice results. We get much smoother surfaces than what we had gotten um, when using the online slicer. We were wondering if, well, maybe we could do even better if we did uh, four times that sampling in the Z direction as well. So this, in this case, we've got um, 64 samples per, is it 64? Four times four times four, yeah, 64 samples per uh, voxel. You can see that gives us a smoother looking slice. We've got more gray levels and maybe a slightly better print, but I'd say the, uh, the quality improvement is, is not as great as, as uh, I might have hoped. Something else we tried was to increase the number of uh, samples per voxel by a factor of four in each dimension. So um, this again is using uh, four times super sampling in each of X, Y, and Z. And this is just a close up of, um, again, the same size hemisphere printed and here's close up of its uh, top level slice. This is at four times super sampling, here's at 16 times. So again, you can see we've got lots more gray values, much more, a much smoother looking slice, and maybe a, a sharper, sharper edge here to the slice than we had here. Um, but again, I would say the, the degree of improvement was not uh, great. And when you consider that to go from four to 16 times, that's um, four times the number of samples in each dimension, uh, so that's 64 times the number of samples we're looking at, which means something that took a minute to slice at 4x takes about an hour to slice at 16x. So probably not worth it. But it could be something that a user could decide to use. If a user uh, wanted to, absolutely. They got time to kill. All right, so um, another thing we looked at was to use the same number of samples, but to choose their positions more, more widely. So this shows the current str uh, uniform sampling strategy that we have that's implemented now in Print Studio. These are the sample positions within each pixel. We got four by four of them. Um, so this uniform positioning is um, relatively straightforward to implement, but notice it means if we've got, a ed if we've got an edge that's parallel to either the X or the Y axis, we can only resolve four different positions within here. And if it falls somewhere between, if it's not quite parallel, but it's tilted slightly, well, it can be tilted quite a bit before it would intersect one of these sample points and we would be able to detect the difference. So Eric Haynes um, suggested we might want to try a different sampling strategy, um, one called 16 Queens, where the samples you can see are arranged more uniformly. Uh, in fact, no sample position has the same X value or the same Y value as any other one here. So now if we had an edge parallel to one of these axes that was moving through here, um, we would actually uh, resolve 16 different positions. Before I could actually implement that in a prototype, uh, Jason Bellinger, also of the Toronto team, suggested that we try a scrambled Hammersley sequence that's shown here. Uh, that was, we figured that would be easier to, to generalize to three dimensions, and it, w and it was also implemented in the uh, Kalpana framework that uh, Print Studio is based on. So um, what that gives us is uh, a quasi-random um, set of sampling positions. So you can see it actually changes from pixel to pixel. Uh, one, one other possible issue with the 16 queens, since, you, since it's the same pattern, in each pixel, there is the possibility that you're going to see more, um, more A patterns or other such sampling artifacts. So we tried out the scrambled Hammersley sequence. And again, so this is comparing uniform sampling to scrambled Hammersley. This is the top slice image. You can see, again, that gives us, for the same 16 samples per pixel, a, uh, a much, uh, much more accurate um, slice image, and we may have reduced these moray patterns that we see here somewhat, but again, I'd say not, not a huge difference. 
Something that I just tried this week, though, um, I would say does look promising, is to change the way that we combine the samples within a voxel. Currently, all the sampling um, strategies that we've used so far have used a box filter, which is to say all of our samples come within the limits of a, all the samples for a voxel come within the limits of that voxel, and they're all equally weighted. Uh, to use a Gaussian filter, we actually take sample positions that are outside the voxel, and we weight them according to this uh, Gaussian function. And so you can see the effects on a slice. This is looking, this is the vertical direction. Um, this is not a slice, this is a cross section through our stack of slices. And you can see we've really blurred this edge. It's basically Gaussian blur like you might be familiar with from Photoshop or something. And that indeed uh, does, I would say, significantly reduce these morays, um, seems to reduce the stair stepping here. So that looks promising. Uh, again, this is computationally expensive. In this case, it's 15 samples. It's 15x samples. 15 samples in each of x, y, and z. So that's over 3,000 samples per voxel. But again, can give much better results, maybe. How long would that take? Uh, how much time have you got? <laughs> uh, you know, and also, you know, this. We could use a broader filter here. We could look at more samples to either side and get this even blurrier and make this even uh, smoother, presumably. So it's a, it's a question of how much time you want to spend on it, I think. So one other thing um, that is, is very computationally inexpensive to implement and that also seems to give uh, good results is simply to add noise to the um, gray levels that are found in each slice image. Uh, this can be done as a, it's a very simple process per slice. Uh, don't have to look at the 3D geometry at all. After your slices are made, it's simply a matter of going through and leaving the white pixels and the black pixels, but for all the gray ones, adding some noise to them. And as we add different amounts of noise, uh, we can make those moray patterns disappear in the noise, and we can end up with this nice matte texture. So if your original model, if your design intent was to have a matte surface, a smooth matte surface, then this is going to be a higher fidelity design, even though we're, we're getting there by adding noise. Okay, so we've seen that um, grayscales can be used to uh, improve resolution. They can also be used to compensate for nonlinearities in the system. So in our um, Ember, as it initially shipped, the projector was applying um, a, a gamma correction to the input video stream, which meant that this was our output in intensity that we got as a function of gray value. Instead of being a nice linear function that we would like, it was essentially de-emphasizing the dark grays. And that's done for a variety of reasons that, you know, are buried deep in the history of uh, video. It basically amounts to a uh, gamma correction that they're applying of about two. You can see it's pretty close to this line, although they've, they're doing it, they're not quite doing it in this nice simple way of just raising the input to some gamma power. Um, clearly they've got a lookup table that's deciding where each of these should be. And again, we're only looking at one channel. We're looking at the blue channel of the projector in video mode. For a gamma of two, you would want to apply a gamma of one half to correct it. Essentially, it's the, the mirror image across this linear line. And if we do that to these values, well, this is the kind of correction that we could expect. This was um, calculated rather than measured. Um, but we can see the effects here on an anti-aliased um, 70 degree sloping surface. Um, this is with the projector um, acting this way and um, our grayscale assuming that it was linear. If we alter our grayscale by applying this gamma correction, we get something that's a little bit smoother. Now, I looked, um, when I showed you before this, uh, these uh, vertical slopes, uh, so like here's from the 32 gray step, you can see this is actually pretty damn linear. Well, there were some that were kind of bowed out this way. There were some other ones that were bowed out that way. But I didn't see any consistent 
variation that would suggest that we would want something like gamma correction for horizontal offsets. But if we look in the vertical dimension, whoop, OK, so here's looking through uh, the, the cross-section through the image stack again. And now what we've got is along a horizontal surface, we're doing a grayscale gradient, 32 steps from white to black again, printed that, extracted the profile. And here you can see it goes down to this point, and then it's pretty much flat across there. If we expand it by a factor of four vertically, that's even clearer to see. So essentially, for gray values down below about 45%, we're not getting anything. And if you remember from that voxel growth movie, there was nothing happening until we reached some threshold. Suddenly, it started growing. Well, so we can fit what we're actually getting, though, to a curve. Um, based on recent information from Brian, this probably should be a, a natural log curve rather than a quadratic. But uh, they both fit it quite well. And the idea is the same. If we take the inverse of that curve, in this case, use the quadratic formula, we get this for our uh, correction curve. We can apply that to the gray levels. So here again, this is the same print from the previous page with the full grayscale um, progression. Here's the corrected version. You can see it goes to black at the end. We have this sharp drop at the end. but where we had dark grays before, we've got much lighter grays now. This is the printed edge. And if we extract, extract that profile, expand it, again, you can see we're getting something that's more linear. Now, we've lost dynamic range. You know, we no longer are using all 32 of our steps. That means some of them have to be doubled up. So there are going to be runs across here that are going to be flat. But on the whole, it does allow us to get a more linear result. OK, so quickly, as I'm running out of time here, um, I tried applying that correction factor to uh, the slices in this uh, hemisphere. Uh, before correction, this is where, with the original slice, this is where we would have expected that profile to come compared to the ideal profile of that hemisphere. And, and here, I've, you know, this is 25 microns, so I really exaggerated the height here compared to the, the scale along the x-axis. Corrected we should be able to get a lot closer to the ideal. Um, this is the corrected version. You can see the, the outer rings, the gray values have gone up. And it looks like we are getting some improvement here in this uh, north polar region. All right, so quickly, some other uh, stupid grayscale tricks. Uh, you can use them to manage through cure. Uh, this is the first print that I've shown that actually used 50 micron layer thickness. So looking at these image stacks in cross-section, here the build head would be at the top, so the z-axis going down. Uh, so these are uh, square in cross-section. And here I was printing these little 3 by 3 pixel shelves off of a uh, vertical wall. And because of through cure, we were getting additional um, solid resin being formed up here. By replacing some of those white pixels with gray values, I uh, was able to get something, again, with higher fidelity to the original design intent. And probably with better selection of gray values, I think we can get something even closer. Uh, something else we just did recently. Um, I've talked about these, uh, I've mentioned these scalloped edges that we get along our prints. Uh, now, Steve uh, and Brian came up with an explanation for what is probably causing those. And that suggested that if we were able to increase the amount of light that we were giving each slice um, just along its edges, that that might improve those. And um, so in this case, these are 200 micron layers. This is um, our high speed resin. And uh, using a model that Steve cr created with some square posts and some circular posts, um, up in this part of the model, um, I, I simply reduced um, the whole slice image by a factor of four, so replacing the white with a 25% gray. And down in this part of the model, I did that at the centers, but I kept the outsides of those slices as white. And then up to the exposure time by a factor of four. So the insides are still getting the same exposure that, that 
in, in both cases. But down here, we've um, boosted by a factor for the exposure we're giving at the edge of the slice. And you can see that does, in fact, improve the verticality of these uh, edges. This was a pattern mode print, uh, but this does work in video mode as well. And for anti-aliased images, this was the uh, model that I was using. We're looking along this corner. Here is um, the original image stack exposed at two seconds, in this case for a 100 micron layer thickness. And you can see the degree of scalloping we're getting. In this case, I again left the edge pixels at whatever intensity they were at, turned the white pixels inside to 25% gray, quadrupled the exposure from two seconds to eight, and you can see we're getting uh, more vertical edges to each slice. Uh, one last thing uh, that we can do, um, this was taking a cue from uh, the world of lithography and what's called optical proximity correction. Um, this is also a video mode print. Um, we found by um, adding some white pixels at the corners, the outside corners, and some black pixels at the inside corners of objects, we could end up sharpening up those corners. Here you can see it on the eye as well. Um, now this, as I said, was in video mode. Um, turns out we don't need it at this level in pattern mode. I showed you earlier some text in pattern mode, which is really faithful to the original. But it could be helpful at a lower scale in, in pattern mode too, as we go for something even finer. All right, so I would like to uh, take a, uh, um, borrow a term from the uh, world of electrical engineering, what they call pre-compensation, and suggest that uh, many of the methods that I've shown here could be considered forms of pre-compensation. Uh, things like optical proximity correction, gamma correction, image scale correction. Um, if we know that the printer is going to be changing the print from our design, um, there's going to be a change from our design to the printed part in some particular direction. If we can change our design, or at least the data that we're feeding the printer, in the opposite direction, we ought to be able to cancel those out in a lot of cases. And to the extent that we can model how that happens, we ought to be able to do this automatically. So in summary, uh, and some lessons that I learned, uh, I would say uh, use pattern mode if you want to print fine details with high fidelity. Um, Video mode can give you smoother surface and smoother features, but it's always going to be possible to blur your uh, images that you're feeding to the printer in pattern mode if, if that's what you want. And one advantage of pattern mode is you could choose that in parts of the print that you want it to be smooth and still preserve fine details in other parts of the print. Use gray values to get uh, sub-pixel resolution. Um, another thing I found is that as our uh, print quality gets better, it's harder to make improvements. Um, and of course, it's always important to keep in mind you know, what actually matters to a customer. Obviously, for a lot of purposes, our prints are good enough already in a lot of, a lot of customers. So you um, need to consider you know, what do they want and what are the costs in terms of, say, comp computation time. Another thing is that um, with process variations. If you're doing two prints, say, on two different printers and are trying to compare some small change, well, that can be swamped by differences in how those two printers are set up. Similarly, different post-processing um, can have an effect. So I had thought for a long time, well, if I printed the things, the two things that I was trying to compare on the same print in the same print job, that that would eliminate those kinds of process variations. And it does eliminate a lot of them, but turns out even within a single print in different parts of the build area uh, due to things like differences in focus or illumination, we can get different results. So um, this is a that's a really tricky one. Finally, that uh, it's hard to measure these small changes in print quality. We don't really have the tools to make objective measures of surface roughness or smoothness. Um, as you saw, once we start getting down into the, the, the limits of resolution that we can get with our grayscales, it's hard to actually measure um, where those are. So, um, but there we are. All right, well, thanks very much. Thank you.